This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome, everybody. You're tuned to The Baseline. Cali warns y'all discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. We are only a few weeks away before we say goodbye to 2023. Hello to 2024. But uh, the NBA certainly is uh, giving us, the NBA is the gift that keeps on giving, (laughs) you know, as we start getting towards the end of the year, man. Um, It's been an exciting first few months of the NBA season. Some surprising storylines have emerged, you know, some teams that have elevated themselves into the conversation of being playoff contenders, you know, where, where in many regards, we probably wouldn't have even sniffed them as being a top 10 possible team. Um, the, su- the surprising quick start, so to speak, can it be maintained? So, you know, it, it's great because as we near, you know, 2024, the very first month, uh, which is, you know, of uh, of the year, there are just important themed NBA, you know, matchups that are taking place that is going to really kind of spark up, you know, the momentum going into NBA uh, All-Star Weekend and stuff. So it's just really an exciting time if you're someone who's watching you know, the NBA, you know, become the premier sport, so to speak, um, as we get towards the end of the year. And who none better to continue to talk about it um, and, and roll with the, the the greatest of the greats, man. My man, Mr. Warren Shaw, ripping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. What's good, brother? Um, you got the Christmas tree ready to go. You got the presence of the NBA underneath the tree. You know what I'm saying? Where's the mistletoe? <laughs> uh, well... No tree is up yet. I'm we're a little slow to the uh, to the draw here, but my wife definitely has started to decorate. Uh, we do have some lights up on on our palms out here in, in sunny South Florida, um, and some uh, fake or faux gifts outside the out the door. So the tree is, I'm sure, coming. Hopefully, I I'd assume probably by next week in here as we're recording, man. But uh, yeah, the Christmas spirit is always a fun time in the NBA, giving us a little in season tournament here too to get the holiday season kicked off. And as you alluded to, Christmas Day games, you know, a couple of short weeks after that. Yeah, I'm I, I think one of the themes I was thinking about this is like what other kind of, um, you know, themes, um, uh, topics we probably want to have as we get a little bit closer to the uh, the holiday season, because I know we typically do like maybe a preview or, you know, uh, an overview of the of the Christmas Day games. But I think we may have to do an episode of things that we want to be thankful for for 2024 with the NBA. Right. Yeah. Like things that uh, we're on our wish list, so to speak. Like when Santa comes down that tree, what is he dropping for us? You know what I'm saying? That's going to give us the the, the good feels uh, for the NBA moving uh, forward for the remainder of the season, you know? Yeah, I, I like that idea, man. Anything we can continue to keep it fresh for our friends, uh, our fans and listeners out there, man. I'm definitely, definitely about that. So any, any episode topics, we're definitely going to take that into consideration. So as always, man, you are the the creator of great ideas here on the baseline. So why don't we put that into practice here in a couple of weeks? Well, speaking of fresh, right? I know that it's been a little while. We, we we've had it stored away for 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 quite some time, but we felt it only necessary. We talked about this in last week's episode that we felt that the need for us to bring back um, one of our coveted segments. You know, what I'm saying talk ish or abandon ship. Shout outs to our man Buster Rhymes. Um, and the whole uh, Flipmo fam, you know what I'm saying, for inspiring uh, this this uh, this well thought out and and uh, very clever segment of ours, talk ish or abandon ship. I'm excited for us to have that conversation again. As man, hey, you talked about it, you talked it up, so I was like, it's about time to put that into rotation here, um, because yeah, we're what and plus his out games out about too, right? Like, did you did you see his uh, new video that I, he that he dropped? You know, Bus, yeah, has a whole new album. Um, Bus says it's going on tour as well, too. So, um, I'm pretty excited. I've heard a couple of tracks from that as ready, as ready and it's, it's vintage, yo. You know, Bus is still out here. He's doing a great job, I think, mixing in new school and old school, you know, with uh, especially with the features that he has out there. Uh, so if anyway, we're, we're a basketball show, but you know, we love hip hop here, man. But yeah, definitely, I'll check out that new Bus album, man. Pretty tight, absolutely. So, um, you know, this week's show, we're going to do a little talk ish or abandon ship, but basically. You know what we what we do is we kind of revisit some of the um, the thoughts that we uh, presented um, at, during the uh, you know preseason or before the season began in the off season um, our predictions and whether or not you know we still think that you know we should be talking ish about you know staying on that or it's time for us to abandon ship on that on on that thought that we had back you know what I'm saying during the off season so 
it's a really good episode, something to kind of, you know, put us in, uh, keep us in check, so to speak, of whether or not we're really holding true, you know what I'm saying, to our predictions or, you know, our, 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 our commentary about what we think is going on with certain players or teams, you know, as they're stated, you know what I'm saying? So I, I always find it to be fun as well, too, because, you know, Shaw likes to hold me in check, and at times I tend to forget stuff that I didn't said two, three months ago, but, you know, <laughs> tape don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a lot going on for both of us, brother. So, you know, hey, if we forget what we said, it's, this is why we kind of do what we I mean, do here, man. If this wasn't if this wasn't podcasting, man, we'd be politicians right about now. So, you know, <laughs> no. I'm saying, but I I, I don't want to get George Santos out of the. <laughs> No, I don't want to get George Santos out of the out of the uh, out of the basketball podcast. So, you know, you got to keep me in check. Bro. No, please. You know, I, I don't I don't want to be a Senator Davis from The Wire. So <laughs> let's keep yeah, everything okay. in line. <laughs> you know <what> <laughs> anyway, great episode. So you definitely want to tap in as always. Get at my man, Shaw, at Shaw Sports NBA. Or get at me, Game Face Lee, the show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline. If you want to catch this episode and all of our previous episodes, be sure to go to www.nbabaseline.com. Also, if you're checking this out on YouTube and you see the blue and white logo, that's the 19 Media Group family. 19 Media Group, you're running these content streets, so be sure to check us out. To also check out the, the plethora of great content uh, creators and, and people who are putting on some excellent shows uh, covering music, culture, sports, entertainment. You want it, we've got it. So go to www19 Media Group. Dot com. All right, Shaw. So let's get right into it, man. Let's do a little talk ish or abandon shit, man. And uh, again, excited for us to be able to do this because it's been a minute. So I think the first team that we want to kind of talk about um, on whether or not we want to continue to keep talking our ish or abandoning ship, the Orlando Magic and our prediction of us saying that this was basically a tier four type of team that while we think this team was going to be, you know, could be moderately improved. We didn't think that the parts, because not understanding or we're within, we were confident that they were going to be a team, you know, who could find themselves being playoff contenders. So for you, are you on the side of still talking at ish or are you ready to abandon ship? Yeah, I got to abandon ship on our original take. I think we had them in a tier four team out of the playoffs. You know, hey, they need to make a make a strong step in the right positive direction. I know you had Steven on the show here not a couple of weeks ago and, you know, they said playoffs are, are kind of what they expect, but I think you and I were just a little bit like, all right, probably still another year of development, especially with the rest of the Eastern conference. But this team knows how to play defense. Uh, they believe in each other. Uh, they are long. They get it done while people are in and out of the lineup. That doesn't even matter anymore. That used to really be a hindrance to them. They've rolled delineated guys like Jonathan Isaac. Like, listen, dude, you, you ain't got to worry about doing much. This is not your team. And he's coming off the bench. Um, Paulo is definitely taking a step up here. And I think this magic team credit to, you know, Jamal Mosley and what he's got going on there, especially with their ability to play defense. This is a team that's, I'm not, I'm, I'm hesitant to say they're an Eastern conference contender, right? As they they're second in the East as we record, but to say that they were going to be out of the playoffs seems a little bit foolhardy. So I'm definitely an abandon and ship there. I think they're probably going to be solidly in the playoff chase here, um, above that six line. So <clears throat> there's so many things I think we want to get into. And obviously, you know, we can spend a whole episode talking about the uh, evolution of, of the Orlando Magic. But the first yeah. thing I want to say is, damn, they finally got this right. <laughs> right. And I hope us talking about it is not going to jinx this team and jinx what they could potentially have going on by the end of this season. Because I think win, lose or draw, what you're seeing from this Orlando Magic team is something that can be sustainably successful for them for the next few years. And, and I think that's what a lot of people are hoping for. But I think that the aggressiveness of how great they are playing collectively as a team and the turnaround that they're exhibiting, it's hard to ignore that they're going to be, you know, in playoff conversations, Joe. I, I mean, I think the question is, is are they play in or playoff worthy? And when you look at where they're sitting right now, as we just basically pass the quarter mark, you know, of the season, they're in the best position possible to be a legit playoff basketball team. You know what I'm saying? Um, it would ultimately have to come down to them going to some egregious losing streaks before we really begin to start seeing the blemishes and lose that confidence. So I'm definitely going to be abandoning ship on what I said previously. But I think one of the things that really resonates with me about why it's easy to abandon ship on what we said earlier before about this magic team and 
one of it, one part of it was because of St Stephen Cameron's um, assessment, which is great, you know, because I completely agree with him wholeheartedly about why he felt confident that this Magic team is a good basketball team and should not be overlooked. But I think the other thing as well, too, is, you know, we just forgot about Paulo Banchero. Wasn't he not rookie of the year last year? You know what I'm saying? The last couple of years, the oxygen has been taken out of the room in appreciating the emergence of Paulo Banchero's gameplay even when he was coming out of Duke, you know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of people wasn't completely keen on whether or not him as a player could be as this good as what we're seeing of him. And it's only in his second year because everything has been about Victor Wimbanyana. You know what I'm saying? Every, like everyone just completely leapfrogged past what Paulo did. And because he's playing on a bad basketball team, that they're not seeing the, the, the complete package. And the other thing as well, too, is we get caught up in the aesthetics. I think a lot of people get caught up on the look of what an NBA player is supposed to be. And he has to have these unicorn like, you know, measurements like, you know, Porzingis or Wembanyama, um, in order for us to instantly appreciate the level of greatness that a player can ascend to. And there's only two moments that I can that I can think about when I see a guy like Paolo Vanchero for us to say, this guy's going to probably be like, you know, all NBA in a year or two, he's definitely going to be an all-star, you know, this season, no question, but this guy's going to essentially ascend to a superstar status where we're saying if the Orlando magic eventually want to be contenders, it's going to be through him. Right. You look at Paul Ivanchero, he reminds me a lot like Jason Tatum because the question marks about Jason Tatum is, Oh, you know, he's a great scorer. Can he be a great NBA player? And it's almost like we overlooked everything that the, that the Jason Tatum package was bringing because we weren't as confident and believing in that because we're still looking for the next best thing. So what I'm seeing from him and what I'm seeing from the magic collectively kind of really helps accentuate the point that it's easy to abandon ship saying that this team, you know, is still a year away from, you know, getting to a point where we have confidence and them. have confidence in this now, because with the start that they've gotten, it really is going to take some bad, bad, bad streaks before we actually start counting them out of being in the playoff picture. Yeah. I mean, so I'll close it on this. You know, they're in the middle of a nine, nine out of 10, right? They had a nine game winning streaks just snapped over the course of the weekend as we're recording against Brooklyn. Rough showing um, in that Brooklyn game. You know, uh, Mikhail Bridges came out there and just kind of lit them up. But at the end of the day, this is a competent basketball team. They're getting great basketball play from Jalen Suggs here. Seems more confident in what he's been doing there on the floor been competent from the three-point line i think more specifically and they still get marco fultz and wendell carter jr to come back at some point so to me i wouldn't even say it's reinforcements it's just kind of hey they have more more studs kind of coming on the way that fit into their system um and, and it's an amazing situation i think for what mosley has been able to do this part of the season and it would take like you said losing streaks or multiple to kind of knock them out of from where they're at right now they just need to keep up this level of confidence and this level of defense. And I think they're going to be right there, you know, in that five, six range. Last night. I still don't think they're a top two or three team in the Eastern Conference when all is said and done, but there's nothing to sneeze at if they, you know, drop down to five or six here and to stay in above, above that playing line. Absolutely. Um, all right, Shaw. So let's go ahead and talk about the next team on our talk issue or abandon ship docket. Um, and that's going to be the Cleveland Cavaliers who we had predicted them or put them in a tier three type space. Right. So, what is it that you're getting from them? You know what I'm saying? Uh, do you still believe that this team still has that tier three in them? Or are you ready to abandon ship on that sediment? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to hesitantly talk my ish and, and feel like this is a squad that will, will get it together. Garland and Donovan Mitchell have both missed time to start the year. Jared Allen missed time to start the, the beginning of the year. And I think that just was wonky for them. Uh, I feel like this is a team that really should be in the in that top four or five situation here when all is said and done. I, I believe in JB Bickerstaff, you know, as a coach. Uh, and I think that Cleveland has the ability to play some really solid defense, especially with Mobley leading that front line and Jared Allen back there as well, too. Uh I feel like they've addressed the issue to some degree at the small forward. While Max Strus is an NBA all-star. I think he's a very competent basketball player at that three, four position and obviously can space it. Uh, so if they do a better job of getting him like good open looks where he's not having to create and try to do too much, uh, I think they'll be all right at that three position and should be a pretty good basketball team moving forward. But they have shown some signs. They have some ugly losses this year, uh, but I'm going to attribute that to the guys being in and out of the lineup here. And hopefully Cleveland Cavaliers can be the topper, topper echelon team in the Eastern Conference as we predicted. 
I'm going to continue to talk ish. Um, I, I might, but I'm going to be even more um, shaky on it. Let's let's just say that I'm I'm a quarter of the way on the plank. <laughs> okay, I'm a quarter of a way on the plank, right? Like, you know, it, I understand you want to continue to talk ish, but if you talk ish, you'd rather be talking ish on the actual ship, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, let, let's put it like this. Yeah. I got. Oh, hold I got, on, you doing you doing the hold me back, hold me back. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got the life raft hanging over, just you know what I'm saying? Because you know, I'm, I'm I'm being prepared, okay? And let me tell you why. A couple of reasons. Number one, um. This team still hasn't figured out how to score the basketball with consistency, which I think right. is supposed to be really one of the things that stands out when you look at the level of athleticism and, and, and scoring capabilities that this team can exhibit. They could potentially exhibit, right, which with Mitchell and Mobley and with Garland. And I understand the injuries definitely can hamper and plague that, but you would look at their – you know, they're the, the points that they're they 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 are gaining and you look at points allowed and there's really like a one point eight two you know, maybe two point differential. Right. So and 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 they're neither of them are like top 10 ish. Right. Like, you know, so there's they're somewhere in the middle. Right. So maybe part of that is continued to the early struggles. But I've often said and I think we've said this numerous times. Your possible young son, I don't know where he is now, if he's with, you know, what I'm saying if he's now you've set him up for adoption. Evan Mobley, he to me um, is the key. I, I I can clearly recall this because I had a side conversation the other day with the dude who brought up this kid's name. He's like, yeah, man, this dude dropped 20, 20. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I was sitting there saying, who are you talking about? And at first I was going to say Alfred Sangoon. <laughs> I, I was talking, talking about your boy, right? Who gets that in like in his sleep nowadays, right? Uh, with, with the Houston Rockets. And he was talking about Evan Mobley. And I was like, oh, word? Even I was shocked Evan Mobley had, had that, that kind of performance. But you know what doesn't shock me, Shaw, is the conversations that we've had that this should be Evan Mobley on a night-in, night-out basis. I'm not saying he should be getting 20-20 all the time, but I'm just saying he should be giving you far better consistency in his output and production. And to me, he is the X factor to whether or not the Cleveland Cavaliers are going to be a successful basketball team. If his output is going to be like Anthony Davis-ish, you know, and I'm only saying that because it is the truth, right? There's inconsistencies in Anthony Davis's ability to dominate. You'll get it sometimes and you won't get it sometimes. Evan Mobley operates in that same space. You'll get it sometimes and in most times you won't get it. If Evan Mobley is not operating in a dominant space in his position, the Cleveland Cavaliers continue to struggle, right? And we're not saying that they're not going to be good enough to get into the playoffs. We're just saying they're not going to be good enough to make us take them seriously about contending when all of the hoopla was around them getting down Evan Mitchell to help put them over the top. So unless J.B. Bickerstaff figures out a way to kind of change that, you know, navigate through that or, you know, maybe change the dynamic of how they score that basketball or, you know, who they're, you know, who, who that ball goes through in order for them to get to that status. I'm going to always hang on the idea that part of the reason why we're going to never take the Cleveland Cavaliers seriously is because, I don't know if we can take Evan Mobley seriously and the dy and the parts around that team if it's going to come together in a way for them to be the type of contenders that we think that they're going to be. Even if they they fall into the tier three, like not dominate to get to the tier three, they fall into it. We're going to always say, well, they're going to be knocked out in the first round. Maybe they'll get to the semifinal round, but we'll never feel confident about them getting to an Eastern Conference championship unless all of their players, Garland, Mitchell, and Mobley, are clicking on all cylinders. Well, I said in the beginning of the year that I think Mobley needed to be at a 20 point per game clip. Garland could step down from that and maybe even up his assist. But again, they've missed, you know, five games to begin the season. Uh, Garland did, and as did Mitchell. So I think, again, it's continuity that needs to be situated here. I'm going to stand on and continue to talk ish about Garland being the guy that needs to step back to allow Mobley to, to progress, I think, offensively. Uh, but at the same time, as you're alluding to, Mobley has to want it. J.B. Brickerstuff has to put him into positions, in essence, to, to be successful as well. But I think between all of those factors, uh, that has to click in a way that allows him to be successful. So he has to want it, be put in a position, in essence, to, to, to get there as well, too. And that somewhat has is going to be at the behest if you will of jb bickerstaff and even darius garland when they're on the floor together absolutely you're tuned to the baseline cal lee warren shaw discussing the hot button topics of the nba and this is our talk ish or abandoned ships uh episode 
uh, where we're basically revisiting some of our predictions and analysis earlier this year and uh, seeing how whether or not they've come into fruition. Um, and we can continue to keep talking that issue or it's time for us to, you know what I'm saying, walk that plank <laughs> and get off the boat with them. All right, y'all, let's talk about the Houston Rockets, right? This is a, a Houston Rockets team that has it's, it's surprised a lot of people. They're playing basically 500 basketball. Like right now as we're recording their game under 500. But I don't think anybody anticipated them to be as competitive as they have been already the early outset of the season. And in the gauntlet of the Western Conference, we really thought that they were going to be, you know, um, the, the, the whipping boy for, you know, for most of the top tier teams. But they have been holding their own. So do we still consider them a tier five type uh, type basketball team, Shaw, or are we looking at them as a team to take seriously and we abandon ship on that earlier uh, prediction? See, I mean, I, I'm going to qualify. I'm going to take them seriously, but not in the essence of like, you know, they're jumping into uh, a home court advantage in the Western Conference. Or jumping into uncharted waters. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, so this is a, a, a basketball team that's better than expected, but there's still some struggling and very concerning things that are happening. Um, as we record, just a game under 500, but they have lost every single game on the road. <laughs> so they are eight and nine, and they are are zero and eight on the road. Uh, that's not good basketball. Despite the discipline that the Doka has put into place, they are one of the top defensive teams in the league, which we we kind of expected them to take a leap, but maybe not to this level at, at this at this grade of depth this fast. Um, so those are things that they can absolutely continue to build on. I think Jalen Green is still struggling to find his role within this offense. We haven't seen the level of consistency there, but that's because Shane Goon has been so dominant and so good um, kind of controlling that offense, as I can continue to say, as the, the great value brand of, of, of Jokic. Uh, Dylan Brooks has been really good from the three-point line uh, for the most part, um, and there's a lot of great habits there. So I think if Jalen Green specifically can give them some level of consistency offensively, uh, they get Torreson back and he plays healthy and guys like that, and this is a team that can get out of that tier five where we have them, where they beat absolutely no shot um, when they can actually, you know, make some noise and maybe, maybe, maybe fight for a play in here too. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to abandon shit from our earlier prediction that they would have been competing for a number one draft pick uh, this year. Cause I think they're a lot better than, than that as, as they've shown here this season. Yeah. I'm going to abandon ship on the belief of them being a tier five basketball team, but I'm going to still continue to talk some ish about this, the, the dynamic of this team a little bit, because I'm still, I'm, I'm still curious and still waiting to see, um, what this team really could potentially look like. Um, and the reason why I say that is because you know how the makeup or the identity of some teams um, can be seen through who you draft. It could be seen through who you acquire through free agency. You know, there's a, it, 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 this makeup of this team is a very unusual team. I, uh, I think about the, um, the movie like uh, the losers or uh, the, uh, the unusual suspects, right? Where you take, a band of mishaps, outcasts, you throw them all together and you basically say, what do we got to oh, like the replacements? You take a band mm -hmm. of mishaps and you say, we put them all together and they have like this one magical season that opens up everyone's eyes. But then, you know, to the real people who kind of really look at the makeup of this team, the dynamic of this team and what's driving them and what's motivating them and what's, is it sustainable through the course of, you know, the next couple of seasons? And I would be interested to see whether or not what they're doing is sustainable and is it sustainable in that Western conference? Clearly it's not. I was going to push back on you on the, on the sediment Shaw about, you know, when you look at this team, this team can't win on the road. I'm like, here's the funny part. You look at the golden state warriors. This is a team, right? Like that, that likes to play on the road now, but can't freaking win at home. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, you look at their home and road record, it's just ridiculous. And last year, this was a, the, the Warriors were a team that could not win on the road for crap. You know what I'm saying? But they were most, most dominant at home. So it's kind of funny how this all plays out. I'm sure that the games and the scheduling will kind of level that off a little bit. But, you know, I just look at the team in and of itself. And while they are showing you better defensive effort, which I think that's the question here, like, what you were getting from the previous iterations of the Houston Rockets team is just effortless defensive basketball. And clearly Udoka has implemented and, and put more onus on those guys holding more accountability that they should be better effort being played on the defensive side, but you can clearly see they're struggling to score that basketball. And part of it is because a lot of those guys now are playing on, on this roster. You can see 
where their reliability to shoot the three, their reliability to hit mid-range jump shots, some of it can be clearly compromised. To me, you have the only one dominant you know, presence in Alfred Sangoon who's showing you that he can be a matchup problem uh, to the opposition you know what I'm saying? And can be a go-to guy in certain respects, but he's still learning how to play this game. He's still learning to evolve. So all of it is going to have to come together. And it's just going to be interesting to see if you can make it, can, can make that happen within that very first season, like he did with the Boston Celtics. Uh, and, and I think again, right now, what fifth in defensive rating. So all immediate impact, I think on that side, but the offense has got to come around and, and be more consistent I think Van Vliet can obviously shoot it a little bit better right now, shooting 40%. But we know his percentages have been down even from the Toronto days. So Van Vliet's got to figure out a way to, to get more efficient and better better shots and get that shot to fall a little bit more often. Jabari Smith has played pretty well here in, in, the, in this season. So uh, I don't think there's anything to sneeze at there too. It really stems from Han, Jalen Green, and Van Vliet give them better offense uh, efficiency offensively, and that'll help Shingun even more. And even with that going on, Shingun's still almost averaging six assists. So, you know, and those are going to be the guys he's primarily passing to and Jabari and the Dylan Brooks out for, for cutting and then Tori Eason as well, too, as he works his way back, you know, from injury. Uh, I really like this Rockets team. Um, they still need a Men Thompson to get back at well at some point, too. They're, you know, they're young rookie. Uh, and I think there's a, a possibility for this team to, to hover around 500 as they are here now, which would put them well above the tier that we originally put them in. And like I said, could have them fighting for a play in spot. Uh, and I think that'd be a huge step forward for this Rockets team it has lacked a lot of discipline and a lot of just, you know, real professionalism in the years previous to this. You're tuned to the baseline. Cali Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA coming up. We're going to continue our conversation of talk ish or abandoned ship. Uh, where we dig into some of our earlier predictions and see if whether or not we're still on it or it's time for us to walk the plank on that sediment. Uh, but before we do that, if you like using debit or credit, I just learned about something that's definitely a game changer. Discover Cashback Debit. It's a checking account that rewards everyone with cash back on everyday purchases, which means you can get cash back on tickets for the game, snacks, team merch, all with no fees, making this season a total win. Check out eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashback debit. Discover Bank, member FDIC. More baseline with Cali Warren Shaw. Don't go away. We're back, Cali Warren Shaw, Baseline NBA Podcast, and our segment of Talk Ish or Abandoned Ship Shaw as we continue to keep it moving. So let's talk about this Dallas Mavericks, right, man? Like I mentioned before about the dynamic of this team um, and, and and what's happened. And, uh, and to me, I'm, I'm completely flummoxed. Like I have no idea what, you know, maybe we said something. I, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to be tooting my horn. You know what I'm saying? I would hate to think that they, they were motivated by our you know, double speak, <laughs> but uh, the Dallas Mavericks, man, I've obviously shocked a lot of people as being one of the top tier teams in the Western conference at the early outset of the season. We had them predicted as a tier four team. Shaw talk ish or abandon ship on the Dallas Mavericks. I'm talking ish, man. I listen, Luca came out the gate, John blaze, you know, man on fire, the whole nine uh, shouts to him. Just had his first child. I um, mean, he's still hooping. Uh, but they still have some levels of inconsistency, you know, defensively while they're eighth in offense or 22nd in defense. Uh, and I just still think despite the hot start and things have looked a little better than I would have expected. I still think this is a team that is at the play in line. Um, mm -hmm. So right now they're sixth in the Western conference, which isn't bad, you know, 11 and eight. There's some other teams in the West that probably should be better than they, than they've shown thus far. Um, and I think if those teams start to get better, that probably pushes Dallas's down back to where we originally had them. So I don't think this is a bad basketball team. I just think they're teams that are better overall in the Western Conference, and they probably haven't shown those shops just yet, with the exception of Memphis, who we spoke about last week. And, you know, we're no reason even to bring them up here in terms of the uh, talk to short bandit 
conversation. So everybody else, though, the Golden State, the Lakers, et cetera, all those teams could probably be better than, than they've shown, which would make it tougher for Dallas to stay in that sixth seed that they has at their currently in right now. Yeah. So I'm going to act, I'm going to make like our, um, you know, our, our partnership uh, with Blue View Footwear. And I'm a, I'm a step lightly <laughs> on, <laughs> on, on my sustainable thought about the tier four with the Dallas Mavericks. I am going to agree with you on the sediment, Shaw, that I think because of the struggles for most teams in the Western Conference, it has helped the Dallas Mavericks get elevated to a degree where we should take them seriously. But I think the makeup of this team and through the long haul of the course of this NBA season, I think this is a team who will show susceptibility and fall back into place. Now, with that being said, I think the greater, the greater question is, is, is this the year that we actually take Luka Doncic seriously for MVP consideration? And I think that question will be answered when we see another stretch of games where Luka Doncic shows the type of dominance that he showed in the early outset of this season, because you can clearly tell that when he's playing at that level, the Dallas Mavericks can clearly be a better basketball team. With that being said, the Dallas Mavericks have to be a better basketball team if there is any hope for them to be a play on playing, let alone be a mm -hmm. playoff basketball team, right? So, and it's hard to say whether or not Donkic is at that level because we said that that's probably what was going to need to happen for Jokic. We said that that's probably what's going to need to happen for Embiid. You know what I'm saying? That like it's not just doing it um, for six, seven games and then falling off the face of the earth for another 20 and then coming back and then showing the level of MVP dominance that you're capable of. It's being able to do it sustainably through the course of an NBA season where they'll take you seriously. So to me, I agree with you. I'm not going to abandon ship on our sediment about where we see the Dallas Mavericks. But the only reason why I feel like that is because there are better teams who I think will figure this thing out. And from a talent perspective, we still have not seen the rest of the roster show that they're going to be able to compete on that level through the course of an 82 game season where you look at the, the record by season's end and say the Dallas Mavericks are among the best teams, you know, in the in the Western Conference. I, I, I just don't see that, you know, but I will see stretches where they look like a really, really good basketball team and they'll compete. Um, but then you'll see stretches like, you know, where they'll be down like they were the other night against the Oka, uh, the Oka, I'm sorry, the yeah, the Oklahoma City Thunder, and they had to go on a 30 and 0 run and still take that L. You you come back from a 30 0 deficit, you win that basketball game. But this is what happens when you don't compete and you have to struggle so mightily and rely on your MVP player to to walk to, to get you through that 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 line. If he has nothing left in the tank, someone else has got to step up and do that. And you're just not seeing that collectively happen with this team. So, well, you know, this is a Mavericks team, Shaw, that, I, you know, again, you can see glimpses of, of goodness, but it's hard pressed to tell me you're going to see glimpses of greatness by the time we get to the end of the season. Well, interesting in that 30 year run, there's a Kyrie Irving joke to be made because he was unavailable for, for that game. So I think if you're looking for that aspect of having, you know, a secondary running mate, that should be Kyrie. Um, he's played 15 games this year, so he hasn't missed a large part of the season. Um, but at the end of the day, ironically, they get down by 26 or whatever it was to OKC. You have to go on a 30 old 30 old run only to lose that game still by six in the, in the closing minutes. Like It's rough. It takes a lot out of you. But had he had a guy like Kyrie, maybe they're maybe they're not down 26 to begin with. Or if they go on that 30 or run, you have somebody else who can take some pressure off of that. So that's something to continue to watch. I think when it comes to the Dallas Mavericks, you know, will that dynamic ultimately play itself out to be fruitful uh, for Luka and Kyrie and Tim Hardaway right now, you know, leading the leading the league in bench scoring. So probably the front runner, if you will, for six men of the year, because he's scoring the most points off the bench. Um, if he can continue in that in that space, then Dallas will have a better season, I think, than you and I predicted. But I still feel they're going to regress here a little bit to the mean because their defense isn't up to snuff in any capacity to my liking. Um, and I think there's still some levels of offense here now that we've seen um, that have maybe been a little bit a little bit more to their liking, and I don't know if they'll be able to keep up that level of consistency that, as, that they've shown here. But Luka's great and will be in the MVP conversation, um, but they need Kyrie to kind of be that running mate here to kind of keep things even at status quo as they are currently. Real quick question for you, Shaw. You have more confidence that New Orleans Pelicans will have a better record by seasons and than the Dallas Mavericks? And the, the Pelicans have this, have a have the same issue, but only to a larger degree. Can Can their core stay healthy? 
Ingram, McCollum, Zion, even Valanciunas. Valanciunas hasn't been healthy, uh, but they need all of those guys. And um, to me, there's more variables there <laughs> that make it harder. But New Orleans is this weird team that can beat anybody or lose anybody. Um, so that that makes me nervous for the Pelicans. And uh, you know what? I would probably downgrade them had I had the confidence to even put them in this list here. So I probably would be uh, an abandoned ship on my level of confidence on the Pelicans. Impromptu um, talk issue or abandoned ship? Because I don't know if whether or not we actually had Zion Williamson in a conversation of saying Zion Williamson will ever win an a, a, a MVP. Uh, at some point through his NBA career. so But I'm going to put you on the spot real quick, Shaw. Would you talk ish or abandon ship on the idea that Zion Williamson will win an NBA MVP award? Uh, I don't even feel like I'm put on the spot. I would abandon ship on that all day. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no... There's nothing about what we've seen thus far. Yes, he's had one, the one dominant season, uh, but do we ever think he's actually going to play 65 full games? And with the comments he made earlier in the year when they were really struggling in terms of trying to get on board and trying to figure it out, and those types of things concern me. And not to say that he can't figure it out, but um, if you're asking me right here today in December, in the year of 2023, that's that's a that's a hell no. I don't think he's an MVP candidate. In the in, in waiting, if you will. And isn't it amazing that during this time span, we don't hear people talking, right? The same people that were bigging him up, you know, Shaq, all of these cats talking about, oh, you know, he's the next guy in the line. He's gonna, you know, we don't hear them talking like that. You know what I'm saying? Oh. They'll get to a point where they'll talk talk about him and what he's not doing, but they'll not acknowledge the fact that they had already had this dude ascended to be winning MVP titles. And and we what we kept saying, just wait. Just wait. You know what I'm saying? I mean, is, is this guy, he can be dominant, but it doesn't mean that he can be MVP level. And it doesn't mean that he can't be capable of it. But I just don't see someone, I just don't see it in him where he's going to go out there and he's going to be your MVP yeah. kind of guy. He's a guy yeah. you, you you compliment with, you pair him with someone, yeah. maybe an MVP like kind of player to allow him to be dominant. But he is not that he is not that dude, man. He's not. And I'm not saying to be disrespectful, but I think it highlights what we're talking about. I have more confidence that Luka Doncic will win an MB an, an NBA MVP trophy sure. before Zion Williamson. Yeah, the odds makers on that, I know they wouldn't have to work very hard. So you'd probably have to wager a whole lot to even gain money on on that specific bet. The Pelicans are definitely going to be a team that's uh the sum of their parts. And while Zion will be a, a straw, if you will, that stirs that proverbial drink. I just I agree where I don't think he's the lead guy. It's it's the combination, the culmination of all the guys there that can make the Pelicans successful, especially with him being healthy and playing well. But I don't think that he's in an MVP stage right now. And I think we have a long, long way to go before we get there. That doesn't mean he won't have a great career. It doesn't mean he won't even be at all NBA and all stars, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but when you think about MVP, that's a very, very special designation. And we're just a long ways away from that right now. Absolutely. All right, Shaw. Final talk issue or abandon ship, the team edition of the segment, Los Angeles Lakers. We had them pegged as being a tier one team. Are you continuing to talk that issue? Are you ready to abandon ship on the Los Angeles Lakers being one of the top teams in the Western Conference? Let me be very clear. I'm gone. I'm out of here. <laughs> Roadrunner style. Oh, you mean you were already you were already loosening the rope on the on the on the life raft that I had set up earlier? Is that what you were doing? It is. It Damn, is, bro, you could have given me a heads up. It's not like yeah. I didn't want to jump on that boat with you. Listen, I, I definitely drank the Kool-Aid of, of what they had uh, going into the season, and they will tell you, um, and they're not wrong. They've had a lot of injuries as well. Okay, Vincent, Rui Hachimura, et cetera, et cetera. Guys haven't, they haven't had their full complement. I think D'Angelo Russell has been really good for them. Uh, Austin Reeves has not taken the leap. I need to abandon ship on that too. I think he's been good, uh, but I don't think he's been next level, and now he's coming off the bench. Uh, because things weren't going. But first five games, you heard the Lakers, Lakers faithful talking about, oh, no, we need a third star. And I thought we abandoned that that concept itself. So to hear them saying now that they felt like, oh, well, they need to get into the Zach Levine conversation or the DeRozan conversation or whoever's available conversation to pair alongside um, you know, AD and, and LeBron here now, that's just 
it's it's indicative of a team that doesn't have the same level of confidence that it and swagger that it did coming into the season where everybody including ourselves here thought they were number one uh or in the conversation for for the western conference title and they can shift things and make things happen and you know palinka is known to tinker i think as we've seen here in the short time here uh, but as currently constructed this is not a team that i would uh be 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 confident in talking the ish about them being at the top of the western conference yeah, so I, I'm I'm abandoning ship and I'm putting that sh I'm like I'm setting the ship on a blaze. Like I, I I I'm trying to tell people they need to get up off this ship. I'm I'm trying to help. You know what I'm saying? Like the Titanic. I'm trying to direct people. You know what I'm saying? And tell people you need to get off the ship as soon as possible because something bad's gonna happen, right? And I and I think that this is what's gonna take place. Now, I'm not saying that this is you know a dumpster fire. It hasn't. It's not about that. I think that. This is a team that is going to, they'll be relevant, right? They, they will be competitive. But I think there's a whole lot of overblown hype about whether or not this team collectively can come together and really be as good as what they showed you at the end of last year. And I think this kind of, you know, rare in its ugly head a little bit. First and foremost, the only mistake that, and I questioned it, but I, you know, I, I, again, I, you know, I could be either or about it. The fact that they they retained D'Angelo Russell, um, he to me just is not the right point guard for that type of offense. I don't think that he completely is comfortable in setting up and and and, and elevating the pace of play with the talent that the Lakers have for them to play at the optimal level that is necessary for us to believe in them being a top tier top tier team. I'm not putting the blame on him. What I'm saying is is that it does start with the head with with, with the point guard. You know, his way of playing and his pace of play just doesn't roll with what you, you you normally see from a team that you have a LeBron James and an Anthony Davis and a Jared Vanderbilt and a bunch of other these. And even with Austin Reeves, I think Austin Reeves has been the one who's most been compromised by the style of play that D'Angelo Russell, um, you know, and his pace and what he does on the basketball court. With all that being said, it does not absolve and it does not excuse the fact that this team just can clearly struggles and does not consistently score the basketball at a at a clip that makes you feel confident that when you play against the likes of the Phoenix Suns, against the Denver Nuggets, against the Minnesota Timberwolves, that they're going to be able to keep pace. So the only other way that they're going to be able to show that they can beat those teams is that they have to be better defensively, which you're clearly seeing that they're not, even with Anthony Davis, who... Again, the bigger question mark with Anthony Davis is what version of Anthony Davis do you see coming out on that basketball court on a night in, night out basis? Because he clearly does not want to be the man for, for, for the Lakers. He says that and everyone wants to pump him to be that way. But that's just not how he's built. That's just not his M.O. You know what I'm saying? So you need something else. You need another dominant, um, imposing presence outside of LeBron James that will give the team the confidence that they don't have to rely on Anthony Davis showing up to be Anthony Davis, that there are other players who are going to play at that kind of level to supplement that. And I think it's going to be hard for Darvin Ham to find that. It's hard for Palenka to find that. And it's hard for this Lakers team to kind of see that happen as they go through this gauntlet of these other styles of teams that they're competing against in the likes of the Kings and the Warriors and all of these other teams where there are mismatch problems in other phases on the court that they can't account for and, and that the talent is not there susceptibly to be able to hang with that. So that, that's the struggle with the Lakers. Are they maybe a two, three tier team? Yes. Tier one. Absolutely not. I think all very well said. So if they make the moves and, you know, trade uh, Austin Reeves and Brewery for, for Zach Levine, that gives them some offensive firepower. It would force other guys to step up um, because they would lose some depth there. Uh, but we'll we'll see. I don't think this Lakers team is going to stand pat. There's still three games above 500 here as we record, but I just don't think, as you alluded to, they're at the top of the Western Conference in the way that we were expecting them to be. Um, but maybe if they get their guys back, they'll prove this take wrong here. But right now, we're both abandoned in ship. Absolutely. All right, coming up, Shaw and I will do a fly through on our talk ish abandoned ship on some of our individual player predictions and what they've been doing already at the early outset of the season. So are we going to continue to talk our ish about them, or is it time for us to abandon ship on those on those predictions? You don't want to miss out here on The Baseline. We are back, Cali Ward Shaw, Baseline NBA Podcast, as we continue on with talk ish or abandon ship. But before we do that, hey, for all of our NBA heads, are you looking for the ultimate destination for NBA gear? 
look no further than the NBA store. With a huge selection of authentic and high-quality products, including jerseys, hats, and accessories, the NBA store has everything you need to show off your team pride. Plus, with exclusive and limited edition items, you can make your collection truly one of a kind. And with an online presence, you can shop from anywhere in the world. So don't miss out on the latest trends and experiences. Visit the NBA store today by clicking our affiliate link. If you're listening to us on your favorite audio platform, be sure to check the link in the description of the show. The baseline is working in affiliation with the NBA store slash fanatics and will be compensated for your patronage by utilizing our link. And as always, we thank you for your support. All right, y'all. So as we continue our conversation on talk ish or abandoned ship, Let's start with our man, the unicorn, Chris Stapps Porzingis, and his role acceptance. I had uh, been very skeptical about that, obviously. I, I was not completely keen on this trade. The Boston Celtics are among the best teams. Uh, there have been a few games where Porzingis has missed out um, due to some injury, as expected. But the bigger issue is whether or not him accepting to be that third guy um, on a team that already has clear offensive fire uh firepower um i'm going to abandon ship on my earlier segment i think that he is a great complimentary piece um it'll it'll be hard to say whether or not he is going to be a key piece that is going to help move this team to that you know nba finals conversation get them back into the nba finals we'll have to see like what his production is going to look like but to say that he can't fit in with what the celtics need and have wanted and it not bear fruition. Um, I got to eat my words on that. Good on uh, Brad Stevens on making this deal. I think that he works well with those guys and will continue to get better at doing it. And will be it'll be interesting to see if whether or not his his output at that four or five level is one that causes those type of problems with, that can help put the Celtics over the top and get past you know teams like the Sixers and the Bucks and the and the Heat with ease. And really, it'll only be a question of who they match up with against in the Western Conference. Yeah, I'm only going to support you in the aspect of like, hey, I thought it would potentially work out. Um, I think I've been maybe a little surprised at the way Jalen Brown has struggled. So I think his role has been hard to, for him to accept, I think, with Porzingis being there. So Porzingis, in a lot of ways, is the third option, but has functioned almost like a 2B. Um, but he's been super efficient. So I think just looking at the shot diet, Porzingis is definitely the three, but he's putting up comparable numbers points wise to Jalen, um, just with better efficiency. So Jalen is the one I think who's struggling the most, but they have a great actual rapport amongst themselves, uh, Brown and Porzingis. Uh, so when Porzingis gets back out there, I think, you know, that will continue to flourish as, as the Celtics continue to, to build that chemistry. Uh, but they've used Porzingis as a lob threat, which I didn't necessarily expect coming into the, into this. And he's been pretty good. I think defensively blocking a lot of shots and some key blocks here to win a couple of games as well, too. So I think really good, good job there too. A little better than I would have expected. So I'm glad to see that you've come around here on, on KP on Boston. Yeah, yeah, man. I I, I kind of swerved around the corner um, to coming around to that sediment. I will say this, though, an extension to your point and an extension to where I'm coming from and why I've abandoned and shipped on my earlier sediment. I don't think this happens if Brad Stevens doesn't pull the trigger on bringing Drew Holiday onto this roster. And and look, we're, we're not going to be talking about Drew Holiday in any MVP kind of conversation. He's not going to be in any most improved awards. And I don't know what awards you're going to say, but I'm going to tell you as far as bringing together a really eclectic group of guys in the first year, who's impacting a starting roster, like what the Celtics have had to do to overhaul that roster in some respects. I think that Drew Holiday may wind up winning the MVP award, like what he's been able to do. I don't think you get this kind of production from Porzingis unless you have a Drew Holiday. Now, I th I'm sure that they were probably leaning on Derek White kind of being that guy. You see, he's getting extensive minutes. I mean, this guy is a Swiss Army knife, like of the likes I don't think I've seen in quite some time. I mean, they weren't even using Malcolm Brogdon the way that they're using Derek White, which tells you the confidence that Missoula has in Derek White. But when you look at the way that this team is playing cohesively, the backcourt of the Boston Celtics is so essentially important. He makes that team, they make that team go, man. He, they say, and maybe to some degree, that's part of why Jalen Brown is struggling a little bit, but I'll take that because I think he will eventually figure it out. But the, 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 the combination of Drew Holiday and Derek White cannot be um, overlooked as far as us seeing the productivity and efficiency that we're getting um, from Porzingis and also the, the quality shot selection and MVP level elevation. Some, I want to say moderate MVP level elevation of Jason Tatum that we've already seen in early outset of this season. 
Good call. They're a good call. I'm going to do an in-show audible here, CL, and say, oh, want, let's skip the MVP conversation because okay. you know, let's let's be a little better than some of these other shows out there and wanting to talk about MVP so early on. And let's, But let's go into the coach of the year selection, you know, whether or not I'm going to talk ish or abandon ship here. Um, and, I, well, OKC Thunder are, are sitting second in the Western Conference. I picked Mark Dagenau to be coach of the year. Save Jamal Mosley. I don't know if there's somebody doing a better job. So I'm going to talk ish, man. I think, you know, what he's got going on there with OKC um, is truly a testament to how they've been able to uh, figure out their their roles, uh, what he has instituting them with them offensively and defensively. Chet Holmgren has been, you know, right there amongst the Rookie of the Year com- conversation. Uh, J-Dub, Jalen Williams has taken another leap here in, in his second year. And Shea Gilgis Alexander is firmly within the MVP conversation. So all of those things lead OKC to um, right now, second in the Western Conference. And I would be crazy to walk away from that and not thinking that Dagonal and company, uh, Dagonal rather, um, and company can can maintain some level of, of excellence this year. Not saying they'll be second in the Western Conference all year, uh, but we're, I see this as a team that's going to be firmly within the playoff position and not fighting to get in here, which will give him an opportunity to win that coach of the year. I got to ask you this question, Shaw, this, since you decided to, 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 uh, to, to bring up um, Holmgren. How realistic do you think it will be for Holmgren to win rookie of the year? I think there's a realistic shot, man. Like as it, 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 and I know people on the surface are going to just look at how badly the San Antonio Spurs are playing, but something has to be said that Holmgren has, has been key to this team's ability to be where they are. And his numbers are <laughs> Are very comparable to Wimbanyana's man, and so it'd be hard pressed for me to, to 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 think. And do you think it would be the greatest upset in the world with the hype that has already been given to Wimbanyama if Holmgren winds up being Rookie of the Year over him? I don't think it's the greatest upset in the world. There'd be some people who are com- sorely disappointed. I just think Chet is fighting a super uphill battle because of that hype train, you know, that is going on there. But you know, almost, what is it, eighteen and eight and and two assists, two blocks. I'm just you saying know, 40% from good. three. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, 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 there's a lot of teeth to that argument and a team that's winning. He's, and he's essential to that team winning in the way that there are. I just think because he's not as freakish and is probably not going to be on as many highlights as Wemby is that the hype train might've already like, it just left the station. So I, I agree. I agree. I thought Chet was going to be in this thing from the very beginning and, and, and should be, and will be to the very end as well too. But as I've seen it play out so far in these first 20 plus games from a media standpoint, while people appreciate Chet, there's just still awestruck by what Wemby's doing. And I think that awe is probably what's going to carry over to the votes when it comes to rookie of the year, say, assuming he can get to the 65 games, assuming both of them can get to the 65 games minimum that's now in place. Mm. This is going to be interesting, Shaw. It really is going to be interesting. We might have to, we have to, you know, put this one on the shelf for a, a revisited talk issue or abandoned ship, but <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I, I'm liking what I'm seeing from Chet. I, I really am. He's 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 showing me some things, bro. He's showing me some things. All right, Shaw. Um, so as we continue our conversation on some talk issue or abandoned ship, let's go to six man of the year. My prediction was uh Malik Monk. Um I'm gonna continue to talk my ish about Malik. I think you know, Malik Monk is still, you know, in a position where he can clearly be a, a, a key guy. I know that there's been rummagings about the struggles with Kevin Werder in the starting lineup. Um, and, and even Malik Monk, to some degree, has somewhat struggled. The Kings, you know, have struggled a little bit out of the gate. I still think that there's plenty of basketball left and there's pretty, plenty of competitive play uh, still to be had. So I'm going to continue to talk my ish that Malik Monk will wind up still being sixth man of the year. But I think the potential of that has been jeopardized now by the expansive pool of quality play coming off of the bench from other teams, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and I had touched on it already. I think uh, I exp- my pick was it was Emmanuel quickly, and he's still right up there. But uh, Bogdanovich, Tim Hardaway Jr., as we alluded to a little bit earlier, those guys are right now scoring more. If those trends continue, then – Again, the history tells us <laughs> that the guy who scores the most is more or less going to be the the um, uh, the sixth man of the year. Austin Reeves unexpectedly has moved into this into this role uh, while he's not scoring 
at a high clip and not that he's a bad clip at 13.7 um he's shooting pretty low from three point land but he's doing everything he's almost averaging five assists and five rebounds a game so for us where we like hey can it get to somebody who does a little bit of everything austin reeds could uh sneak into this conversation here too so uh i appreciate you you know talking that ish and there's no reason not to, but as you alluded to, there's a lot of people who have entered the proverbial chat here on this conversation that we didn't necessarily expect to come into it um, going into the season. Even a guy like Cole Anthony in Orlando. So if they continue to have that success and he continues to come off the bench, there's no notoriety that's going to come along with that conversation. Yeah, you know me. I'm the hype man, right? So I have no problem with hyping up, you know what I'm saying, I guess who is that that's supposed to be at the top of the line so that these guys have, have know who they're chasing, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> once they once they get that award though, they know who to pay the royalties to. All right. So I, I have no problems with that. I whatsoever. Like that. <laughs> You're tuned to the base like Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. All right, Shaw. So our final talk ish and abandoned ship. And I'm glad you saved this one as the last one because this was a really great conversation that we had in our predictions, our awards predictions, right? And we said that there was had to be a scenario that would allow this to play itself out for it to be a realistic conversation. So in our talk ish and abandoned ship, we had the most improved player year of the ward. You looked at Alfred Sengun for the Houston Rockets. And I looked at Tyrese Maxey and the caveat to what we were saying is that the only way that we can realistically see, well, I'm sorry, you said that the only way that it's realistic for the Philadelphia 76ers to, um, for, for, for Maxey, to be in that conversation is something has to happen to James Hart. And lo and behold, after we had that episode, <laughs> something happened to James Harden. They, 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 something happened to James Harden, right? <laughs> so now, based on our predictions, are you going to continue to talk ish or abandon ship on Singoon? And obviously, when I continue to um, look at what's going on with Tyrus Maxi, am I going to continue to talk my ish or abandon ship on Maxi being most improved? Well, you would be crazy to to abandon ship on Tyrese Max. <laughs> right? I would I would have to be on some um, on some Lucy juice, right? Exactly. Okay. Things things have broken exceptionally well, I think, for for your selection. And well, while I did qual- nicely for me, yeah, you know I'm saying I'm riding a very nice wave right about now. Yeah. Yes. And while I did qualify it, and that qualification did come to fruition, uh, I'm going to continue to talk my ish about Shingun. Um, As well, you and, should. And I think you know at, at 21, 10, and five a game here. Uh, that is, that's, that's, that's next level stuff here. And even with the, 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 the league's best player, if you will, um, roaming the, in, in Denver, uh, I feel like Shane Goon's going to have a chance to be an all-star this year. Um, and therefore really be in the midst of that conversation. This is a thing right now. I don't know how you choose between either one of those guys. And I, I, and I actually would not split up the award and this is not me just trying to be dodgy or I don't want to really make an answer. I think they're both deserving. And I split that award right down the middle because they're both deserving. But Maxi is a certified baller. That guy is a boss. He is a blur on the basketball court. He does everything with a great attitude, great compliment to Joel Embiid. I have nothing but glowing things to say about him, but I'm not going to just throw my guy Shingun under the bus uh, because 21, 10 and five is, is pretty damn good as well. Okay, so let me go ahead and <laughs> – for you, Shaw, because I don't think a lot of people put Sengun on that radar. I think a lot of people expected him to vastly improve but not improve to this level. So – and this conversation, again, doesn't happen until you elevate his name in that conversation. I think it was easy for us to want Maxi to be in that conversation. But again, given the circumstances, it was hard pressed to see if whether or not a guy like Nick Nurse would be willing to pull the trigger and actually hand the reins over to Tyrese Maxi and say, I want you to work with Joel Embiid. Now, I don't know if Joel Embiid had any say in this. Don't care. All I'm saying is, is to your point, we're finally seeing the best versions of what a Tyrese Maxi uh, on your roster looks like. And that to me is all-star Maxi, right? Like he's going to be in the all-star team this year. No question. Okay. But I'm going to go even one step further. I'm going to talk my issue even one step further. I think he may be the key reason that Joel Embiid will take consideration of coming back to the Philadelphia 76ers. Because you don't go through these growing pains unless you have the confidence that there's one, two, three players in that locker room who you can clearly see are becoming better players, especially after you've gone out and gotten yourself an MVP trophy. And that MVP trophy wasn't, you know, because of James Harden. That was because of Tyrese Maxey. You know what I'm saying? Tyrese Maxey has been through the wars, sitting on the bench and eventually being on that starting lineup 
and putting Joel Embiid in the best positions possible in most times. So I feel like this could really elevate the conversation. Now, this is gonna, isn't gonna is going to carry into any measures about being most improved for him. The numbers speak for itself. Whether or not Tyrese Maxey actually wins it, or to your point, Shaw, it can go to Alfred Sengun, all good on either side of it. Because we essentially were predicting that it would take these two players to really elevate the conversation to validate that trophy, whoever winds up winning it. But for the Philadelphia 76ers, it is so critically important because if they're going to keep pace with the likes of the Celtics, with the likes of the uh, the Bucks, with the likes of the Heat, it has to be with the level of play that Tyrese Maxey is playing next to Joel Embiid. Yeah, well, listen, 27 a game. I, I sat here and just – Speaking with Gary Washburn on another show that I did, you know, covering the Celtics, and we're just like, "They're a scary basketball team." Yeah, there's, 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 there's no answer for him right now. So him blitzing you and giving you 27 is not just happenstance. This is kind of who he is or who he's become right now. And yeah, he's got to finish out the rest of the year and be healthy and, and the whole nine and do that. But there's no reason to think that he won't finish at least above 25 per game at that six, seven assist mar margin, you know, and right now his assist, he doesn't really turn the ball over as well too. So he does that. He plays at the speed at which he plays at, you know, one of the fastest guys in the league and stays within control almost 90% from the free throw line as well too, 40% from three. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> this guy is, he's really, really good. And I agree with you. That gives, should give Embiid all the incentive to, to feel like, yeah, I can make Philadelphia my home. Um, just a couple more tweaks on the margins here. Um, and the Sixers team, I think it's going to be right there in the thick of the conversation here in the Eastern Conference. Oh, man. Woo! This has been a good one, man. This, yes, has, been, this has been a very, very good episode, man. I, I like when we uh, put our proverbial minds together to come up with the uh, the, the diabolicalness of, of 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 bringing these kind of conversations uh, to our listeners, man. This is this has been one hell of a hell of a ride. Either way, you know what I'm saying. We're gonna have to start elevating our um, our uh, when we are abandoning ship, man. I think I, I think I said life raft. I think we need a speedboat. <laughs> <laughs> we need we need to start being a little more lavish and. <laughs> Oh, I like that. Yeah, with our escape mechanisms man. yeah man living the nba lifestyle i'm all, i'm all about that but hopefully our fans and listeners will definitely tap in let us know what takes you are a talking ish or abandoning ship on um and if you agree with our assessment you know are we are we jumping ship too early here only 20 games into the season or are these trends you know what are going to be the norm here for those who we are no longer kind of backing with our original takes so let us know here make sure you hit us up at on instagram at nba underscore base or on x at nba baseline Absolutely. Once again, we like to thank you and yours for the baseline, Cali Warren Shaw. We appreciate you guys. You know we do. And we'll catch up with you next time. <laughs> <laughs>